Welcome to a very special edition of Indianomics. My guest is one of India's longest serving economic policy makers, second only to Dr. Manmohan Singh, actually. My guest is Dr. C. Rangarajan, former Reserve Bank of India Governor, 12th Finance Commission Chairman, former Chairman of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. In fact, Dr. Rangarajan has made or influenced policy in various capacities all the way from 1982 to 2014. That is 32 long years. Now he has put down the takeaways from all these 32 years in his just published autobiography uh, titled Fox in the Road, My Days in RBI and Beyond. Dr. Agarajan, before I come to you, sir, uh, about uh, your book, let me just add for the benefit of my viewers, how seminal was your era in the Reserve Bank? 1992 to 1997 is perhaps the most important five years in RBI's 85-year-old history. Those were the years that transformed India from a command and license economy to a market-driven economy. They freed India from the Hindu rate of growth of 3.5% until then, you, mostly till the 70s, to a 5 to 6% growth in the 90s and then to the 7 to 8% growth in the 2000s. Dr. Agrajan, congratulations on writing this book and uh, for agreeing to speak to me today. Well, uh, let me begin, sir, with the book. My favorite chapters start from chapter 4. You're calling it the crisis years 1990-92, all the way to chapter 7, the external sector and making the rupee uh, uh, convertible on the current account. Uh, can you tell us what do you think were the biggest uh, achievements or, uh, you know, what stands out for you in that very crucial period? Well, there are many things uh, that happened uh, between 1992 and 97. Mm. Um, but even in the 80s, mm. um, a lot of effort was made in order to bring about changes in the approach to monetary policy and in the conduct of monetary policy and revitalizing the money market and so on. Uh, the attempt to reorient monetary policy started in the middle of 1980s, but it can bloom into its full phase uh, only between 1992 and 97. Uh, I would say that in some sense, uh, the uh, what happened between 1992-1997, even at the Reserve Bank, uh, falls into three distinct parts. One relates to the conduct of monetary policy, uh, the change in approach, uh, the freedom given uh, for conducting monetary policy. Second is, are the changes that were made in the exchange rate management and the management of the external sector. And the third, of course, is to modify the banking system, reorient the banking system uh, and strengthen the banking system uh, by introducing the prudential norms. Therefore, in some sense, all the three areas uh, underwent significant changes during the period and uh, the reforms in the financial system, the reforms in the monetary system corresponded and tied in with what the changes were happening in the entire system under the new regime. You know, the uh, stuff of uh, uh, Reserve Bank of India governor memories is the fights they have with North Block. Did you have any? Well, in, in, in one sense, um, there are differences of opinion. It cannot always be said that whatever RBI said or whatever the government said went through automatically. It is not so. Obviously, there are two independent institutions with two different mandates, uh, even those subserving a much larger uh, common uh, purpose. Uh, but as I used to say, to, uh, that we were, in a sense, passing through a crisis. 
and um, it was a very difficult period. If I may say so, uh, the conditions did not permit the luxury of the governor and the minister fighting with each other. Um, the, uh, therefore, the, there are two things. Obviously, there can be differences. And how those differences are ironed out, how they are uh, reconciled, or how they are uh, managed. Therefore, problems can arise um, between the central bank and the government because of strong differences on views or strong um, differences in the way in which the differences could be um, sorted out. I think both are important. But I will say that um, what is really required is to allow the central bank of the country the freedom to operate on certain matters given a mandate. Uh, the inflation targeting idea is a, is a, falls into that category. The mandate is was given by the, the government that 4% should be the target, but you can go plus or minus a 2%. Then once that um, mandate is given, the freedom to operate must be that of the Reserve Bank of India. Therefore, in some sense, the mandate is something on which the government will have a say. But once a mandate is given, then there should be no, no interference with the uh, freedom with which the, the central bank of the country operates. Uh, you that is... Uh, but the way you have uh, taken this answer uh, wants me to drag you to your last chapter, actually, where you are speaking about ruminations. You know, over there you have uh, uh, spoken at length on uh, the new MPC. You have been an inflation warrior yourself and uh, you have spoken about the uh, current uh, proclivity or, you know, the perennial tendency of people to say, no, no, the inflation is higher than the mandate because of supply side. And you've even quoted Friedman to say that uh, monetary, uh, that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Uh, at this juncture, the Reserve Bank and the MPC, the newly, the young body, the MPC, start standing at a very crucial juncture where it is tempting to believe that, you know, other countries' inflation is so much higher than their own targets. Therefore, we should not go hammer and tongs at raising rates to bring our inflation to 4%. Uh, what, what would be your opinion, sir? You think they should be very uh, wedded to 4% and work assiduously towards it? Steve, first of all, the mandate clearly indicates what the uh, medium-term goal is. Uh, the medium-term goal is 4%. Freedom is given to be around that plus or minus 2%. The first thing that we should really do is that we should get back into that comfort zone. And uh, the, the, that is clearly uh, warranted. Uh, we, when we are operating beyond the comfort zone, my interpretation of inflation targeting idea is that first action must be taken to get back to the comfort zone. Then how much time you take once you are in the comfort zone to get back to 4% is, um, is a matter of judgment, uh, is a matter of looking at a variety of circumstances. But the attempt to get back into the comfort zone, in my opinion, uh, should not be uh, a matter of uh, discussion or a matter of vacillation. Now, that is uh, the approach that I will take. I don't think the MPC is uh, disputing that point at all. They're okay with 6%. I'm not very sure whether they're, uh, you know, getting to 4% in a hurry. We don't know. The meetings are still underway. Uh, so I have to take a quick break. But more on this issue and on whether, you know, at this juncture, the interest rate also has to be used to be a bastion for the rupee. That question also, since your ruminations chapter raises that issue. I'm coming back with that question after this break.
Welcome back to this very special Indianomics where we are discussing the newly published autobiography of uh, former governor, uh, doctors, former RBI governor, Dr. C. Rangarajan. By most estimates, uh, uh, Dr. Rangarajan was governor during the most eventful period of RBI's uh, 85 years, the years 92 to 97. Uh, Dr. Rangarajan, thank you for waiting on. I'm coming back to the uh, questions on the 92, 97 period again. But before that, you know, we were talking about the MPC. At the moment, the external members of the MPC believe that theirs is a domestic mandate to bring down inflation. But RBI is a full service central bank and has to worry on the fact that uh, uh, the Fed is hiking rates in a hurry. And uh, there is an interest rate differential which can have an impact on the currency. There is also a current account deficit which is running close to 3%. So do you think interest rates will have to be thought of not just for inflation? No, it so happens at the present moment. Uh, the action required to take care of the external problem, that is to uh, prevent a very sharp deterioration in the value of the rupee. Also uh, coincides with the measure necessary to bring down inflation. It is not a conflict that you are uh, seeing. Therefore, in my opinion, the, uh, the objective of trying to bring down inflation coincides with the objective of also acting on the, um, on the uh, very external value of the, of the rupee. Um, uh, to me, um, it happens to be one instance in which uh, there is no conflict of uh, action. Mentally. I agree with you, though it appears that some of the members of the MPC in their previous minutes sounded a bit dovish. You know, there is another part in your ruminations chapter, the last chapter, where you are worrying about growth. You point out that, uh, you know, the reforms did usher in a higher level of growth. From three and a half, we came to five to six percent and then to seven to eight percent uh, in the 2000s. But you're worrying that that trend is speaking off? Yes, I, I think the, uh, as I point out in the, in the book, uh, the reforms uh, should normally create a climate for investment, a climate for accelerated growth. Post-2011-12, uh, the uh, growth rate of the economy has been sliding. Um, initially, one could understand it because uh, there is always a cyclical phenomenon in every economy. Uh, when, a, when an economy reaches the peak, and then for a time, uh, the economy also slides. But it has continued for a longer time. Perhaps the um, downturn could, could have been uh, managed uh, better. One significant thing that has happened is post-2011-12, uh, the investment rate has been coming down. And that is really the key for economic growth. Therefore, the, the investment is the driver of economic growth. We need to address this issue um, quite uh, strongly. Uh, the, uh, the, the investment rate now or the gross fixed capital formation rate is only about 28.8%. But we were at one time well beyond 33%. But even beyond 2012-13, it was 33%. It's a significant decline from that. Therefore, my concern is that while normally reforms should be creating an appropriate climate for investment, it has not happened. And therefore, while reforms create the necessary conditions for economic growth, but they are not sufficient. We need to really operate the system in such a way that the, the appropriate investment climate is nurtured and uh, uh, it requires macro level and sector wise level uh, um, concentration of um, um, ideas. Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, you actually actually referred to a great deal to even social cohesion and whether that is in lack of uh, social cohesion is impeding investment. I wish I had the time to discuss that as well. But let me come to the uh, issue of uh, bank uh, 
uh, you know, public sector bank and their listing. Uh, I remember during those times you had, I think it was you who had once told us that uh, when you asked for the listing of the banks, divestment of uh, government stake from 100 to maybe 90 or 85, there was a lot of political opposition? Yes, I mean, the, 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 uh, the, the political system attaches a great deal of importance to nationalization of the uh, earlier private banks. And uh, therefore, uh, reducing the government holding in the public sector banks from 100% to 51% was itself a great effort. Uh, um, we really had to persuade uh, the members of parliament to agree to this idea because we, we thought that among many other things that we were planning to do in order to increase the competitive environment in the banking system, this is also important. Therefore, in, in my opinion, um, apart from allowing new private sector banks to uh, come in, uh, another significant step that was taken at that time was to reduce uh, the um, ownership of uh, the government to 51%. Of course, 51% clearly makes it uh, that it is a public sector bank in the sense that uh, the uh, management uh, of the, the bank is entirely in the hands of the, um, of the uh, government. That's a fair point. Uh, I mean, and here's where we have, uh, I would have liked to uh, get your views on privatization of public sector banks, which doesn't seem to be going anywhere. But uh, we may not have time for that. I wanted to ask you about another point, which I didn't see much in your ruminations chapter. Do you worry that uh, growth, you of course spoke about, uh, you have a whole uh, uh, subsection on poverty uh, and its calculation and its reduction. Do you worry that growth is getting stimmied because of what people are calling the K-shaped recovery. We've become way more unequal uh, after COVID and uh, in the last few years, which could be impeding growth, you think? Do you buy that we have become a more iniquitous society? I have a different view on this. The, 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 the point that I would like to stress is that in the early stages of economic growth, uh, the focus of attention should be not so much the inequality of income as much as what is happening to the poverty ratio in the, in the country. As you can see, that poverty ratio may be coming down, but measured by some of the inequality indicators, the inequality may be increased. Therefore, the significant thing that we need to do is really to get the poverty ratio down. And uh, one important thing that happened in the high growth period between 2005-06 and 2011-12 was the substantial reduction in the, in the poverty ratio. High growth supported by um, um, social safety nets can really bring, about, bring the poverty ratio down. I am afraid that since the growth rate has slowed down after 2011-12, and, and as a consequence of it, perhaps the poverty ratio is not coming down um, in the way in which it was coming down about, during the earlier period, uh, perhaps it may, may have also increased. It is, uh, that is the one that we need to worry about. High growth gives two opportunities. One, there is a trickle-down effect anyway. May not be that strong. It depends upon how the growth process uh, takes shape. But another thing, the higher the rate of growth of the economy, the higher the resources that are available to the, um, uh, to the government, and therefore the capability to install and provide social safety nets increases. Look at it. It is the period during 2005-06 to the 2011-12, we introduced the Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. The extended food security system was also introduced during that period. Therefore, high growth accompanied by a policy of uh, in, in, in installing social safety nets will bring down the poverty ratio. And I would really emphasize 
that the focus of attention now must be on poverty ratio. Uh, well, it is, I guess, because the government has uh, the uh, uh, Pradhan Mantri Anna Yojana. So uh, they are uh, paying some attention to that. I, maybe I should squeeze one last question, sir. You are speaking about states should be given the right for income tax. Are you in favor of it? You discuss it uh, at one point. See, the point uh, really is that um, uh, we are all discussing about um, how the vertical imbalance can be uh, filled and how um, certain states have to be um, given um, additional support because of the status of the uh, states uh, in terms of uh, per capita income. But one idea is, can we increase the ability of the state governments to tax more and therefore, uh, the, the, the question or the, the need for uh, the correcting the vertical imbalances uh, may come down. It is in that context, I, I felt that, yes, there are um, many other countries in the world where the, uh, the states, uh, besides the federal government, um, is also being given the power to levy income tax. But I must also say this, that even in the United States, the power to levy income tax is given to states that many states do not levy it because of the competition among states and not to make it costly for uh, enterprises uh, um, to, to run. But always, even in the United States, it's a very simple mechanism. They don't have any separate rules on exemption limit and so on and so forth. All, what, they, what they do is, they take the uh, uh, taxable income as determined by the rules of the federal government and add a tax on it. Therefore, the, the return that you file uh, for the state government is only one page. It starts with what the federal uh, income tax uh, regime says, and on it, yes, yes, a certain percentage is levied on it. I think it is worth looking at it, uh, but it should not essentially uh, be made very onerous. But the very fact that the state governments can defer in the rate of taxation may compel them uh, not to uh, overdo it. Uh, but it is an idea which I think is worth looking at. Well, Dr. Rajan, out of time, but it was a pleasure reading your book and an even greater pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much for joining me and from all of us at CNBC TV 18, we wish you a very healthy future. Thank you very much, Lata. Thank you.